Teddy Soranos is a lecturer of public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School, where he teaches courses in using statistical methods to improve public policy. His primary interest lies in the use of technology to replicate the dynamics of small classes on a large scale. To this end, Teddy develops fully online courses and blended learning modules that he uses to teach residential students as well as civil servants abroad. Teddy is a faculty lead for the Evidence for Decisions area of HKS's online public leadership credential. He is also a co-founder of Teachly, a web application focused on creating effective and inclusive learning environments. Teddy received his PhD in health policy from Harvard University and his master's in public health from Columbia University. Thank you so much for spending some time with us today, Teddy. Over to you. Thanks so much, Erica. Good morning, everyone. Uh, well, good morning for me. I, I hope that you are all doing well wherever this finds you. I hope you're safe and I hope you're healthy. Um, if you're able, I asked in the first slide here to try to rename yourself given the organization that you're in so that I can have a sense of where you're all coming from. Um, and uh, hopefully I'm going to be able to make this a, a pretty uh, involved and pretty participatory session, but we'll do our best to see uh, how we can do this. So before I talk about me, and I, and I would like to talk about me a little bit, before I talk about me, I wanna talk about y'all. So we sent out a survey for that, that many of you completed asking, first of all, where you were all coming from. And here's just a small uh, uh, sense of where you were all coming from. It's really all over the world, all kinds of different places, some in higher education, some in, in various organizations and institutions, a really, really wide gamut of, of uh, organizations that you're all coming from. So I'm hoping that many of you can connect with each other via the chat and, and via um, this webinar. So. It's really interesting to see all your places, but what was very interesting to me is that despite the fact that you come from a wide, wide, wide range of organizations, when I asked what the most difficult thing has been to keep in mind when running an online event, you all said pretty similar stuff. So here is a word cloud of your responses with respect to um, the biggest challenge that you have found when trying to run events online. And as you can imagine, keeping audience engaged was a really, really big part of it. So many of you said the biggest issue is trying to keep the audience engaged and happening, uh, trying to maintain attention, trying to manage the different participants that are happening, trying to foster and encourage the kind of discussion that can be quite helpful. This is the sort of thing uh, that many of you have found in the kind of institutions that you're working in, the kind of events that you're talking about, which is great for me because I think there's quite a bit that we can be doing uh, together. So, um, I'm going to start with a poll, and I I'm hoping that in this session all of you can sort of have an event or a session that you have in mind that you'd like to plan or do in the future. Some kind of, be it a conference or a panel or, or a webinar or something like that. And so I'm going to launch a poll now and ask you what kinds of content you're trying to deliver. All right, I'm going to end the poll and share it with you all. Here is where y'all are coming from. So uh, lots of folks doing panel discussions and training programs, singular multi-day workshop, conference or large event. Uh, fewer of you are doing actual sort of higher ed courses or adult learning courses, um, which I think is quite interesting, but this is a kind of to get a sense of the sort of work that y'all are, are involved in. So uh, before I tell you what I have to offer, I wanna kind of tell you a bit about who I am and why maybe you should uh, listen to me or think what I'm saying is, is worthwhile. So uh, my name's Teddy, Teddy Sferonos. Uh, my website is right here. And my primary uh, role at the Kennedy School is I teach quantitative methods. I teach statistics, econometrics, this sort of thing at the Kennedy School. But my real sort of interest is in figuring out how technology can be used to make online experiences effective, to make learning happen, to replicate the dynamics of in-person and intimate uh, uh, meetings happen on a large scale in sort of an interactive and effective way. So here's a couple of things that I've done on, on my website if you're interested in learning more about the kind of, of work that I write about. But at the Kennedy School, this is manifested in a couple of ways. I run uh, uh, one part of the Harvard Kennedy School's Evidence for Decisions Public Leadership Credential. So the Public Leadership Credential is a set of online offerings for mid-career professionals, and I run two of the six of those courses. Um, I'm also the faculty lead for a program here at uh, the Kennedy School called Evidence for Policy Design, where I do a number of trainings around the world uh, of civil servants and, and on the use of data and evidence in decision making. 
And then finally, I've mo more most recently, quite recently, been charged with transitioning the Kennedy School's courses online as it pivots to online in this fall semester. So we're having a really large effort to move a lot of our work online. And so there's quite a bit being done right now to try to think through how to uh, uh, transition those courses online in an effective setting. So I have quite a bit of experience in teaching online and teaching digitally, but the thing that I think is quite interesting and the reason why I wanted to have this poll, I have this uh, webinar rather, is that we're shifting from online teaching to online everything, right? Everything that we're having to do is now shifting to online. A lot of the work that we're doing that we would traditionally do in person is now kind of being affected somehow in terms of uh, having to happen online. So the question becomes, you know, how can we make sure that we're delivering experiences that are as good or better than what we would do in person in an online setting? So the kind of claim that I'm making in this webinar is that as the world pivots to online, the things that we know in the literature on effective teaching and pedagogy on what works to make uh, uh, online teaching effective can be applied or can be used to make all online events, sessions, interactions effective. This is a, a, a very rich literature that has existed for a long time and has been continued to be developed um, by scholars and by researchers in pedagogy and learning. And so when I say this is data driven digital delivery, the first thing I mean is that this is truly driven by data, which by which I mean there's a huge evidence base that we can draw from on what makes these sorts of things uh, effective. I'm gonna start by, by describing some high level principles, some high level structures that will, and we'll, then we'll narrow down to actual tools that you can be using in your work. So that's kind of the idea here. So I'm gonna go through these three principles. Uh, the three principles are three levels of structure, communities of inquiry and optimizing for online. And in this, I'm gonna ask you to think a lot about an example that you have. So as far as norms go, please use the Q and A box to ask questions. Um, and please be prepared to type into the chat, type your ideas into the chat. There are going to be a number of points here where I ask you to reflect on a session or event that you yourself might want to offer. And uh, I want you to be prepared to think through that session, that event that you're planning, and type your ideas for how you might do that uh, into the chat. Okay, so I'm going to start with principle one. And that is this notion of three levels of structure. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you sort of a pitch for how this works in online learning. And then we'll think a little bit about how we could then translate that to the kinds of settings that you all are working in. So this notion here is drawn from some work by Shulman on what's called signature pedagogies and professions, but you can apply this to any sort of event or session that you're thinking of doing. So the idea is that there are three levels of structure to any kind of session that we offer. The first is what are called surface structures, essentially what is happening, what it looks like. So in this case, it's me talking into my web camera, you on chat and in Q&A, and me going through slides. The surface structures are simply what it looks like from a superficial perspective. One level below that is what we call deep structures. And deep structures sort of reflect the reasons why we're doing what we're doing. The reason why I'm trying to do these particular things is because I believe a certain thing or I want you to work on a certain thing because I think it's important. And then below that one more level is an implicit structure. An implicit structure is simply, uh, uh, in the literature, they say a moral dimension that comprises a set of beliefs about professional attitudes, values, and dispositions, but it really is fundamentally why. So this looks like a pretty theoretical structure, a theoretical framework. So let me give you an example. In the Kennedy School, I teach case studies a lot. And case studies on a surface level is something like this. We have a classroom, we have me at the center of the classroom, I have whiteboards everywhere that I'm using to facilitate discussion. And that's sort of what it looks like on a superficial level. But if somebody asks me what I do in class, I don't just say, well, I stand in front of the room and I facilitate discussion and I write on a whiteboard. I say that I engage students in some kind of complex decision-making process on which reasonable people may disagree, right? So when I talk about the work that I do, the things that I teach, I talk about it not just in terms of what it looks like, but what I'm actually fundamentally trying to do with students. So I'm trying to get them to take on the role of a protagonist. I'm trying to get them to think about a difficult decision that a protagonist has had to make and then think through what we can do to make that decision in a more effective way. But then below that one level, if someone were to say, yeah, but why are you doing that? Why does that matter? I would say, well, in the world, real life is very messy and case studies are an opportunity to dig into that real messy world 
and start to think about how you could actually take rigorous frameworks and apply them to a difficult, complex, real life scenario. So these are the three levels. We have the surface structures, what it looks like, the deep structures, why I do it, and the implicit structure, why I think it's important. Now, I want you to think about trying to apply this to online. So when I shift to online, I then have to think about these other structures. But a thing that I really want to impress upon you is that the implicit structures and the deep structures haven't really changed. Those structures are the same. I still think real life decision making is important. I still think it's important for people to try to engage in this decision making process with a protagonist. So really the only thing that's changing is the surface structure. What I'm doing is instead of standing in front of the room and talking about whiteboards, I might ask students to take positions via a poll, like the poll that I showed you earlier. I might ask you to discuss your perspectives with one another in an online setting, and they might write on a collaborative Google Doc instead of having me have a whiteboard. But the key insight that I see here is that two and three deep and implicit structures haven't changed. What has actually changed is the surface structure. So what I want to ask you to do now, take two or three minutes, and I want you to think about your event, the thing that you're thinking of planning. And I want you to jot down briefly what the surface structure, deep structure, and implicit structure is for your particular event. So take a moment to do that. So as you start writing this, as you start writing your surface, deep, and implicit structures, when you have a sense of what that is, I want you to type into the chat specifically the deep structures. I want you to articulate to me what the deep structure is that you are trying to facilitate in your session. So the deep structure is what is it that you're trying to get participants to do? So Donald is planning an online session for teens on child safety during COVID-19. Nancy's trying to enhance student and faculty success. Harry's trying to change operational behavior. Tony's trying to give feedback on exercises to improve skills. Elizabeth is doing home buyer education, trying to become a homeowner and uh, uh, the responsibilities of becoming a homeowner. These are great. Robert's synthesizing learnings and areas of exploration by this group over the last four years. So I highly encourage you to check out the chat because these are some really, really interesting things y'all are working on. And the thing that, I, that I, I think is really important to keep in mind here is that this deep structure, this thing that you're writing in this chat right now, when you're planning your event, keep that at the top of your mind. That is not something that should change as a result of shifting online. Shifting online should change the uh, uh, surface structure, right? It should change the high level kind of what, what it actually looks like day to day in the session, but not the actual reasons why uh, things are happening this way. Wonderful. So think about these deep structures when going forward. This is a really important part uh, of trying to think how this might work. Okay. We go into principle two now. Principle two is this notion of communities of inquiry. Now communities of inquiry is a thing that uh, uh, is another sort of framework in the pedagogy literature of how to make effective uh, uh, online learning happen. And it really is at this fundamental thing that I think a lot of us are feeling right now, which is that it's difficult to sustain community in an online setting. At least from my perspective, even in trying to keep connected to friends and colleagues, the thing that's been difficult for me is having sort of consistent interactions that give me a feeling of being part of a community rather than just these sort of individual one-off interactions, which I think is quite important. So I'm gonna give you this framework of community of inquiry by Garrison, Anderson, and Archer. And the idea is that in a classroom, there are three types of communities of inquiry. There are three types of connection or presence that you can have. And these three are social presence, that is the feeling that the course is full of real people who see and who acknowledge one another. Teaching, or in this case, organizer presence, that is the feeling that the instructor or the leader of the session has consciously created the experience and is monitoring and adjusting for it for student learning. And then finally, cognitive presence, the notion that everyone involved is engaging in some kind of critical 
and practical inquiry. So these are these three structures, social presence, teaching presence, and cognitive presence. And I wanna give you examples in terms of my teaching in my class of how I try to kind of facilitate these particular things. So for social presence, one of the things that I do is I try to add personal notes and anecdotes in all of my communications. So when I send out announcements, even if it's a logistical thing, I try to make sure to add uh, uh, particular notes about myself, things that other students have sort of said in the discussion forums and things like that, just kind of create a feeling of connection between me and the students, even though we're not physically seeing each other. So this social presence, I think, is a very, very important part of trying to make a sense, trying to create a feeling of having a community in your particular session. For teaching an organizer presence, I try to articulate the reasons for the structure of my session. So in the very beginning of the session, I sat and I said, these are the reasons why I'm giving you these principles. My claim is that uh, the principles of online learning are applicable to all online events. This is the kind of reason why I'm doing it for you and the reason why I'm trying to structure the session in this way. And by that same token, if I get feedback from folks that this particular thing is effective or not effective, I can then try to respond to that and ad adapt the session accordingly. This is obviously much easier when I have multiple sessions, but the notion of trying to be a sort of responsive and uh, present organizer is a really important part of this particular one. And then for cognitive pres presence, I think creating a space for participants to think, discuss, and struggle with content is important. So that's here what I'm trying to do with respect to having you think through your own events and think through the implicit structures uh, uh, of your particular events. What I'm trying to do is to get you to actually engage in this kind of cognitive presence. Now, this is specific to learning, specific to pedagogy, but I really do very sincerely believe that these are the kind of three tent poles of what makes effective online sessions more generally. So again, I wanna ask you to take a couple of minutes and I want you to reflect on how you might create social presence, teaching presence, and cognitive presence in your online session. And when you can think of one, please put it in the chat and start with social teaching or cognitive first so we know what kind of bucket you're putting it in and then send it to, to all attendees, please, where your particular things are happening. These are really great. Are any of the people who are, who are listing things in the chat right now, if you're willing to raise your hand and, and speak a bit about, about your thinking, I think that'd be really great. So as an example, Kevin, Kevin Brooks is saying, teaching presence, recording short videos to provide an overview prompts and clarifications for the week. I would love to hear more, Kevin, about what you have in mind. So if you're willing to, please raise your hand. Uh, Lucila, can you, I'm gonna allow you to talk now. Would you mind unmuting? Oh, hi. <laughs> Greetings from Italy, everybody. Um, oh, hi. Uh, ciao. I would like to, to highlight one issue related to social presence. is the fact that we take into account that everybody knows how to use technology and online tools, but most of the time we also should try to reach out to those who are not familiar with these tools. So in order to make sure that everybody is on the same ground on these things, I think um, we should be able to transform their social presence, which is in the analog world, in the, in the digital world. So to have some sort of ground rules or presentations or tools that we, um, that we share with, uh, with the participant so that everybody feel comfortable when the session starts. That's really fantastic. Thanks, Lucila. Uh, I think that's a really nice point. So the kinds of things that we normally are worried about with respect to how we talk in person, suddenly all of that is mediated through technology. And so suddenly we have to figure out how to uh, create an environment where people can share that freely with one another. And so pre creating ground rules for the kinds of technologies that are going to be used and how they work, I think is quite important. Uh, Kevin, I saw your hand up. I'm going to, if you wouldn't mind unmuting. Can you hear me now? Yep. All right. Hey, uh, I'm in uh, Lakehead University, Thunder Bay, Ontario, Canada. I teach online and uh, I use weekly videos to sort of set the agenda for the week. Uh, I also, also respond to the work that's been happening the week before. So a little bit of social presence and a little bit of teacher presence. And so not canned lectures, but sort of always responding to the class as it's developing and trying to set the new tasks and questions for each week. Wonderful. So introductory videos, framing, 
That's really great. Uh, I see Donald Rukari. Can I? May I ask you to? I think I have to allow you. Go for it. If you can unmute, please. Thank you, Prof. Uh, this, good, good morning to all of this. is Donald from Kampala, Uganda. And uh, we are currently, um, I, I work for Freedom House, so we're working with children and access to justice during this COVID time. So what we're trying to do is, in terms of social presence, is have like test calls. We actually had one this afternoon. We have the webinar on tomorrow. But before this, because this is a new experience for most kids, and we have kids up country who are part of the digital divide, so what we're doing is running a number of test events before the actual webinar tomorrow, so they're able to be more comfortable and, and be present in, in the moment tomorrow. So we look forward to a good event tomorrow. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for that. I think that's a wonderful idea that Donald suggested of creating a space before sort of the content of the session for people to get comfortable with one another, get comfortable with the technology as Lucila was suggesting earlier, that's the kind of thing that can really help to create an effective uh, uh, experience once things start. Uh, how about Baraka? Hello, everybody. My name is Baraka from Nigeria, Abuja. Um, actually, in trying to create the social presence, I think you need to engage the classroom from time to time in questions because some people get carried away. But when you keep asking questions, they will be able to concentrate. And then you need to also explain it in simpler terms, just like the way you did. You gave us a preview. When I joined this class, I didn't know what to expect actually on this uh, lecture. I know it has to do with digital, but when you explained as an overview, I became very comfortable and I'm so happy that I'm you know, pulling along in the lecture. So I think if you explain to the students, give them some kind of summary of what to expect and why you're doing and why you are teaching and tell them the importance they will be willing to listen to you and they'll be carried along. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, great, so I think that's explaining the reasoning and rationale I think is quite an important part of creating a strong teaching presence. So I think that's a really nice one as well. Uh, so for those who couldn't hear, Baraka was talking about how important it is to be able to take the ideas that you're gonna get into in a deep way and explain them as clearly and, and straightforwardly as possible, and to also then pair that with um, a sort of willingness to, to let people engage with it by asking them a lot of questions. I think that both of those things are a really important part of both creating a teaching presence and then also creating a cognitive presence. Uh, how about Tasneem? Hi, greetings everyone. Greetings from Pakistan. Uh, I oh. mostly start my class by uh, initiating focus questions. First, I put focus questions that these are going to be the focus of today's lecture and creating the rationale and, and then elaborating uh, the content. And at the end, just explaining them how these things can be utilized in public policy scenarios. And from there, uh, we actually go to the applies side of the contents learned in the class. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. And it's great to hear from you. Thank you. Um, yeah, same here. So I would really encourage you now to check out the chat. There's some really excellent ones. I particularly like some of the cognitive ones that you are suggesting. For example, Parvez suggested, what benefits would the topic bring if agreed upon? Pushing people to really articulate why what we're doing is important or why it's worth doing to help to rationalize the kinds of things that are happening. There are also a number of tools that are being suggested as ways in which you can sort of elicit people's uh, opinions or thoughts, such as Kahoot, Sledu, and Mentimeter. There are lots and lots of tools like this. I'm gonna talk about a few in a second. Um, but at this point, I'm actually going to do what I think is very important uh, 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 um, practice in any online session, is I'm gonna give you a one minute stretch break. And I want you to just stretch and feel a little bit of recentering to yourself. And I'm gonna launch a poll asking for how you're feeling as you see this content. I have a bunch of different emotions. So please vote as you stretch and take about a minute to think through this. All right, I'm gonna show you it's, it's you know, risky for me to show you, where you what you all responded to, because if a lot of you are upset, then this is a risky thing to do. But I'm going to show it to you uh, right now. So 
Most of you are curious, excited, inspired. That's very good to hear. Some are, are uh, overwhelmed or confused. Uh, to be honest, I, I don't think it is an uncommon thing to feel that when first encountering these things. So I'm gonna try to summarize everything at the end of the session as, as sort of the key takeaways that I want you to take from the session. But I do think it's quite important to realize that I'm, I'm throwing a lot of new ideas and concepts at you. And so I'd encourage you to take a moment and think about what you can get from it, write some notes for yourself for when you actually do these sessions uh, in the future. So, Principle three, optimizing online delivery. So this is perhaps what a lot of you were thinking of when you signed up for the session. This is simply principles involved in just delivering content online well. And there's an extent to which this sort of principle is the same as what you would do in person, but I do think that the cost of not doing it is especially high in an online setting. And I think you'll see why in a second. So a key idea in optimizing for teaching online is this notion of chunking. And chunking is simply the ability to break your session down into multiple smaller sessions. That's all it is. So if you have a particular hour long thing, you're not just talking at people for that full hour and hoping that they keep up. You're instead trying to break it up into little subsections um, that you might wanna do. So here are some examples in the teaching world. If I wanted to do a mini lecture with breakout rooms, I might talk for about 20 minutes then a 25 minute uh, session where I might send you all into your breakout groups to work on specific things together. Then I might bring you back to report out and discuss and then I might wrap up. So no thing is longer than 25 minutes despite being a long 75 minute session in total. Another idea is for a case discussion, 10 minute welcome and kind of framing the discussion, 30 minutes of discussing a particular area of the case, we call those pastures then having a stretch break, then trying a whole separate part of the case in a separate pasture, and then doing a wrap up. And a third possibility is maybe we never meet all together at all. Maybe the entire session is you in small groups working with one another and maybe contributing to some bigger document like a Google slide or a Google doc that we could then all share and look at even if we're never all together in a giant room looking at one another in this massive setting. So you could even think about having this as a particular small group meeting. So uh, as I tell you this, as you think about this, I'm wondering if you can identify sort of why this is important. What are the benefits of chunking? And maybe if you could raise your hand uh, so, I can, so I can call on you, I'd love to hear your thoughts on why chunking might be worthwhile, particularly if you're not in a uh, teaching setting why this still might be worthwhile to do uh, in your context. Let's see. How about uh, Sandra, Sandra Hoffman? So it reduces the cognitive burden and it increases active learning. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Well, I, people can't pay attention for that long. I think that, um, it's hard to listen to someone or focus on content for an hour. So absolutely presenting a smaller amount of, of material allows them to be able to focus and use the cognitive energy it takes to do that. And then engaging them in something active kind of rebuilds the, the energy they have to be able to take in more content and also cements what they're getting out of, out of the content. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sandra. That's really, really excellent. So it reduces the cognitive burden. It lets people kind of stay engaged. Uh, how about Dr. Shanawez uh, Hussein? Uh, I think to me, it's important to uh, keep the audience engaged in the discussion and also to check their understanding, you know. Uh, whether they are understanding and uh, recheck, you know, so that uh, I can give you if something is not clear, I can help them. So this is all about chunking. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Keeping people engaged, uh, uh, keep it, letting them retain the information. How about uh, Tony? Tony, I think it's Osime. I'm gonna... Chunking allows you to present the material in different formats so that you can have many perspectives of the same material. Each chunk represents a different perspective. That, that's Wonderful. my contribution. That's a great one. Thank you so much. Uh, 
How about Sarah, Sarah Alamia? Hi, I am from Mexico. Uh, I'm in the electoral world, and we are working quite a lot in uh, webinars and these kind of spaces. And sometimes I have to speak for one or two hours in order to send instructions and that kind of thing, and it's really boring. So this is, this is really nutrition for me and for my work. And civic participation, we, ha we will have to implement this kind of uh, ways to train or to inform people. So these techniques will be really useful when we are uh, already during the process to inform uh, the, the citizens in general. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, maybe last one, sorry, but we're running out of time. How about Ryan? Ryan, can you hear me? I think, yeah, I can, thanks very much. Um, I mean, I agree with everything the previous uh, commenters have made. In, in, I'm in Ottawa, Canada, and I run a number of online workshops and trainings around digital government. And we've, we've generally been adapting to online, have taken an approach of kind of 90 minutes max as a consecutive session seems to be people's kind of max cognitive load on this. But one question I had on chunking, we've tried with some of our sessions to actually pre-record lecture material and have it available as kind of, you know, asynchronous material people can watch ahead of time. But we've had mixed results as to whether people will actually engage with the pre-recorded material versus the live session. You know, as a teacher, when you've got a class, you can ensure people are listening to you because they're sitting there, right? And, and so I'm curious your experience with pre-recording material so that the live sessions kind of build on that. And if you have any tips around how to make that effective as part of a, a part of a chunking strategy. Sounds great. Thank you, Ryan. And I will definitely, definitely speak to that. Uh, Ryan said that in a classroom, you can guarantee that people are listening to you. Ryan, I wish, I sincerely wish that were true. But uh, I'm going to speak a lot, actually, in a little bit about how we can deal with content outside of the session and make sure that people engage with it. So put a, put a pin on that and I will return to it for sure. So you've pretty much all in the chat and in your, in your uh, uh, speaking talked about the benefits of chunking that I wanted to say making explicit the implicit connections between different kinds of content, reducing undesirable cognitive loads so people can focus on the, cog on the cognitive uh, uh, tasks that are actually beneficial to them, helping them develop more sophisticated knowledge structures by piecing together different kinds of interactivity in the same place. And also, um, Ovidia mentioned that it also helps divide the material into distinct concepts, which I think is quite useful as well. And then finally, and this was mentioned earlier, I think by Sandra, it is allows you to incorporate more active learning activities, right? It lets you do more interactive stuff, which keeps people attention, which has been documented to show that people retain more information. There are lots of reasons why having more active learning on its own is beneficial to do. And so it gives you that opportunity to do so. So I want you to think about how you might use chunking in your own event planning. And I'll give you a minute to give some uh, ideas in the chat. And when I do so, I'm gonna actually give you a couple of uh, ideas for ways in which you could chunk. So I'm gonna, so think about how you could chunk the content of your sessions or your events, but also think about these different ways in which you could try to get participants to do different things. So. You can have them speak, you can have them vote in a poll, you can have them write, you can have them work in groups or share work. Here are some tools that could be useful to you in doing so. Zoom has a lot of them. This is a, a table made by Dan Levy, one of my colleagues at the Kennedy School. So take these and think about it. And then in the chat, give me a sense of what kinds of chunking activities you might want to do. So Donald has a follow-up to, to his comment earlier about his event. He said he can use breakout groups to ask teens to identify issues of safety that they're facing during lockdown. It's a really nice one. Uh, Sanchita's talking about pre-recorded stuff, lectures and quizzes, role plays, things that they can do to get people engaged in the content before even the live session. Trivia or games. Great, it seems a lot of interest in breakout groups. And I think breakout groups can be quite helpful. I use them a lot in my teaching. In fact, one of the disappointing things of doing this webinar is that Zoom's webinar function doesn't allow for the kind of breakout groups that I do in my class sessions, but I do find them very helpful. A piece of advice I would give you all when trying to think about breakout groups is to make sure that when you do so, that people have an explicit task or an explicit question that is targeted and useful to them in terms of what they wanna do. 
Because if, if you fail to do that, it's easy for those groups to then just become people sort of hanging out in a room and not having anything to talk about. Make sure that you're as targeted as you can be. Uh, Bushra, you have, a, you have a comment. Yeah, I just have a small question about it. I just wanted to ask, uh, what should be the ideal number of people in an online class and what should be the ideal number of people in a breakout session? Great question, Bushra. So um, the question is about how many people are ideal for a class and for a breakout group. For, in, for a class, I'm actually not certain that there is an ideal number simply because there's so much opportunity to break people up into smaller groups that you could actually have quite a large class where if you sufficiently integrate active learning and lots of breakout groups and stuff, it could be just as useful as sort of a more intimate one. For breakout groups, it depends a little bit on what you would want to talk about, I generally wouldn't have more than, I don't know, seven or eight people in a breakout group myself, simply because uh, it's hard for people to get a word in if, it, if, it's, if it's more than that. Generally, I try to strive for or four to five for the kinds of questions that I ask. But again, it depends on if your goal is to have a really rich discussion with lots of contrasting viewpoints, or if you want people to dive deep on a question, you might want to have fewer people. But I tend to aim for four to five and generally not more than seven or eight. Okay, so for this last part, we have a little bit of time left. Uh, I wanna tell you what I think the real killer feature of teaching and hosting effective online sessions is. And this actually isn't specific to online, but for me, it is the single most useful thing that I do when I teach and that I've tried to take on to an online setting. And I wanna highly encourage all of you to think about how you can incorporate this into the work that you do, because to me, Everything that I just talked about is quite important, but the real true killer feature, the thing that you really should think about more is how you can use data in your sessions. So when I say data, I mean data about your participants, where they are, what they're thinking about, that sort of thing. So I'm gonna give you two examples. The first is data during a session. So for example, the kinds of polls that I was just doing. So why might you want to do polls? It helps you assess understanding and mood. It helps you adapt. It helps you think about where things are at. And how do you do it? You can use nonverbal chat functions, for example, like raising your hand or typing into the chat or things like that. Or you can use anonymous polling, like what we just did in Zoom with the polls and what Poll Everywhere lets you do as well. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples of how polling can be really helpful. One is simply to assess understanding. And this is in a session where you really want people to sort of get some core concept that you really care about that you want to communicate to them. And let me give you an example. Here are some polls from my class. These are about statistical concepts. So don't worry at all about the content, but I want you to look at the distribution of responses of this poll versus this poll. So if I had these two types of polls in class, as you can see, one of them has a much wider spread of responses than the other. And so when I think about how I want to spend my time in class, doing this poll lets me adapt in real time whether I should spend more time on a particular concept and less time on another. Because in this case, I would probably want to focus on this poll and the content here rather than this one where, you know, 70% of the class got the right answer right off the bat. So thinking about how you can assess understanding and then, and then use that data to adapt your teaching or your presentation is, I think, a really useful thing. You might want to also assess the temperature in the room. How hard was a particular thing? How did you find today's material? When I did that poll after the stretch break of how you were feeling, that was to assess the temperature. Because if a lot of you said you were confused and overwhelmed and bothered, I probably would have changed what I did for the rest of this time. But because most of you were getting excited and inspired, I decided to go on with showing you more material. So think about how you can assess the temperature in the room. You can assess preferences. I can, you can ask people to rank topics. Again, this is from my own teaching, so don't worry about the actual words. But I ask people simply to rank the topics they wanted to talk about, and I use that to help frame the session. And then you might want to use polls to assess takeaways. Ask people what their big picture takeaways are from the session, which you can then use to plan your next session or understand what the big takeaways were and if you got your point across. So these are just four uses for data during a session that you can use to adapt in real time to make sure that you're delivering as effective a session as possible. But some of you might be thinking, well, 
sure, I can adapt, but in the middle of a session, I can't suddenly throw everything out the window and make a brand new session, right? If in the middle of the session, all of you said I'm confused, what would I do at that point? I'd probably go back and talk about the original content a little bit more, but if you're having to adapt in real time, it's difficult to have stuff prepared for that kind of thing. So the, the real killer feature that I wanna talk about, and this is what the gentleman before was asking about, is data that you can use before your session. So I'm gonna go through an example of what I use in my teaching. Again, it's gonna be a technical concept, but I want you to just think about what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. So before the session, I make these little animated videos that kind of show different concepts and why they're important. In this thing, I'm narrating over the formula and explaining stuff and talking about different things. It's just a video that the students watch, right? Once they're done with all that, I then have them do a quiz on our learning platform or a survey. And the quiz looks something like this. I ask them to answer a question, but then more importantly, this is the absolute most important part, I then ask them to explain their reasoning for their choice in the previous question. So on one hand, I could use this to assess understanding. On the other hand, I'm then asking them to explain their reasoning. So the idea here is that what I then get is an actual export of the people's understanding and what they're thinking about way before I even start my session. So when I'm in the planning phase of my session, I can actually look to see how particular students responded the way they did and use that to cater what I'm doing for the actual session itself. This is enormously valuable. And for example, in the survey that I asked you all to fill out before the session started, I got to use your responses for what the most difficult part was about teaching to customize my section to the kinds of things that you all cared about. This is not something that I could have done during the session. I could only do it before the session. So as we think about these three things, the initial video was to expose students to new content. You could do a welcome video so people know who you are. You could do a, a short presentation explaining what the session is about. This kind of thing just exposes them to the new content. But then supplementing that with some kind of survey or poll so that to assess the extent to which they understand the content. And this is a way to kind of make sure that people are actually engaging with it is to ask comprehension questions to make sure that they're really following it. But then the third and perhaps most important part is that you can then learn from student data and customize your session accordingly. I truly mean it when I say this could save you an entire session in and of itself. The number of sessions I went through before I started doing this, where at the end of it, I just thought, I feel like I just wasted that. If I'd really known where people were at, what people were thinking about, I would have totally done a different session. You can absolutely squeeze the most amount of information as you can out of a particular session by catering it beforehand by learning about your participants. So the biggest takeaway I want you to take from this is that using data before, especially during and even after your event can help you know your participants better. It can help make sure your sessions are more engaging and it can help create communities that last beyond the time of your event. It can help create the kinds of bonds that we were talking about in the communities of inquiry. But here are some things you might think about incorporating. Pre-course surveys, like what I did, participant responses, feedback surveys, the kinds of polls that I was doing during class, engagement data if you're involved in an organization in which you can see how people are engaging with your content via analytics, that can be quite helpful as well. And then there are other possibilities as well. But I wanna make sure I get across the key ideas of the session. When planning your session, think about the following things. So these are the big takeaways for folks who just wanted the punchline. And maybe I could have given you this at the very beginning of the session and saved you all an hour, but I think going through it was worthwhile. First of all, think about the format, the reasoning behind the format, and why those reasons are important. So that's the surface deep and implicit structures. What the format is, why the format is that way, and why those reasons are important. Secondly, how can you connect participants to each other, to you, and to the work that needs to be done, right? The social connection, the teacher connection, and the cognitive connection. And then how can you create smaller chunks to help interact, to help participants interact with and synthesize your content? And then finally, do not forget about the power of data and how it can absolutely change your approach to the way that you run these sessions. I think if you do these things, it really can matter quite a bit in terms of getting you 
uh, to um, create sessions that are truly empowering and helpful. And I wanted to really thank you for your time. So you can go to my personal website to see more of the work that I do on teaching and learning and how it works and why I do the way I do. If you want to know more about EPOD and the work that we do around the world in terms of uh, facilitating trainings, please check out this website, epod.cid.harvard.edu. And I think Erica can share that as well. Um, there was a request for the video and the slides afterwards. I'm, I'm comfortable sharing these slides, so I'll ask Erica to share them out um, afterwards. So we'll make the slides available to you all. And thank you all very much for your time. It was really great uh, connecting with all of you.